Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are listening to part two of our interview with Hannah Shaw, the kitten lady. I hope you enjoy the show. Now I'm going to turn the tables a bit, and we are going to talk a bit more about humane education and social media. You have done a fantastic job with social media and reaching out to younger audiences. You're getting recognition in all types of different media. And not that every group out there can aspire to get to that level, but what sort of tips do you have for having a social media program, getting out there and educating your own community, the folks in your backyard about community cats? Thank you, first of all. I do think that we kind of, as an industry, I don't think we value social media enough. As time is going on, we're seeing that that's how young people are consuming their information. That's where people are getting their worldview from, is from the social media they consume. So I think that it is really smart for groups to be starting to look at their social media more and seeing how they're reaching out to people. Now, one big piece of advice that I have for people is to focus on positive stories. Uh, We're learning a lot that that's a much better way to connect with people is to tell positive and uplifting stories. So kind of the days of really sad pictures and things like that, the whole Sarah McLaughlin commercial (laughs) thing, that doesn't really uh, resonate for a young audience. People want to see uplifting stories. So think about everything from like the BuzzFeed type things you see to just like the uplifting videos or stories of transformation. Those are the things that go viral. So I recommend for groups who are interested in getting more involved in social media to really, you know, rather than trying to show everything that you're doing, like pick a few really uh, uplifting stories to focus on and then tell them in a compelling way that people can relate to. Um, And then of course, taking it to the next step, you want to have a call to action. So not just here's this beautiful story of this transformation of this cat's life um, or this really unique story that you're going to find so fascinating, you're going to tag 10 of your friends in it. But also, you know, taking it to the next level to say, here's how you can get involved in your community. Or if you're catering it to people who are already in your community, like, please join us, you can be part of this. Having easy ways for people to then take an action, whether it's a link or even a phone number they can call to get involved with volunteering. I think there's so many ways to tell stories out there, and people love it. People are really looking for solutions to these issues. When you put yourself out there as a resource, I mean, I I can't believe the amount of questions that I receive every day. My inbox is flooded. I can't even read all of them because I have so many people writing me to say, I found a kitten outside. What do I do? I found cats outside. Are they okay? Which is why, you know, instead of answering each of those individuals uh, one-on-one, I focus on creating resources that anybody can tap into because then you can help so many more people. So I think um, social media, it really is the future of being able to communicate with a lot of people at once, but you have to focus on the positives. The other thing I will say is photography is so important. If you're an animal advocate, you have to also be a photographer. I'm sorry to say it for people who are not like tech savvy. Um, that's how we communicate is through images. So if you are not getting good photos, you're not telling a story and you can have the most compelling story on earth, but if you're not able to tell it through images, then people don't connect to it as much. So those are really like the most, the core of the work that I do is storytelling. It is marketing. It's marketing your story. It's marketing your cause. And you do that through, you know, the narrative that you tell, which should be a positive and uplifting one, and through the the images that you provide. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper in on this because you've touched upon several really interesting points. One, you touched upon the fact that your inbox is full of emails. Therefore, there is a potential for social media to add to your level of work 
Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> oh my God, it's a full time job. Yeah. So there may be some ways, though, you are talking about sending people to the website. So there are some not auto respond tools, but there are some tools out there that can help with trying to manage that inflow of emails. And then also you talked about the call to action. And I know that on Facebook, many groups have Facebook pages and there is a call to action button on the Facebook page that I don't feel like is fully leveraged by many groups. And it's a very simple thing to do. You can even just click it to get it to go to a donate link or a sign up for your e-newsletter or whatever. But definitely I recommend folks just looking at that call to action button, doing that one little thing can certainly help quite a bit. What are your thoughts on multiple platforms? It can be really challenging if you don't have the manpower to do it. I have a struggle with it because I'm one person. I do have volunteers who are fantastic. I absolutely love my volunteers, but it's challenging. I, you know, I struggle to keep up an Instagram and a Facebook and a Twitter. Um, there are some very great tools out there. There's one that's it's called, oh gosh, IF. TT, I think it's if this, then that, or something like that. Um, and if you look that up, that is a tool that you can use to set it up so that if you post one place, it also shares it somewhere else in a format that's compatible with that platform. So, you know, I have my Twitter on that, for instance, it's too much for me to run all of these things at the same time and also raise babies and also travel and also create resources for my website and make videos and all that. It's a lot for one person. So having multiple platforms, it is important because there are people who are only Twitter users and there's people who are only on Facebook. My audiences are definitely different from platform to platform. So I notice that Facebook tends to skew a little bit of an older audience. Facebook might have a totally different audience than Instagram, where sometimes I have to remember that some of the people I'm talking to are in seventh grade and <laughs> they don't know anything about cats. And I, you know, I'll see comments and go like, well, what does this person know? And then I click their profile and it's like, hi, I'm Micah. I'm a softball player. And I'm like, oh, you're like a child. <laughs> so, you know, but it's great. We want Micah, the softball player to be, you know, engaging, right. but that's going to be one platform. You're going to have, maybe your donors are going to be more on one other platform. It's just having as, as wide of a platform as you can is definitely important. There's also different functionalities. Like you said, Facebook has a lot better functionality when it comes to linking, or, you know, things that people can share. So Facebook is definitely a good area for people to be. But there are other places, especially like, you know, Instagram or Snapchat, some of these places that a lot of younger people um, can be found. So I'm all over the place. I'm on YouTube also. Um, but it is a lot to manage. But if you can do it, it's it's definitely worth doing. I will say that, you know, with those call to action buttons, I think that that's a really cool tool. And I think that any time that you're going to get somebody riled up about something, whether it's a upsetting story, you know, maybe there's a declawing law, or there's a situation where somebody's going to try to catch a bunch of cats to be euthanized, you know, if you're going to post something like that, you should never, ever, ever post something that is upsetting without also posting a call to action because upsetting people and then not giving them something they can do will actually discourage them from following you because it, it just ruins their day. It's just a bummer. But if you get somebody bummed out and then you say, you know, are you angry? Here's what you can do about it. Then people will take action. So definitely if you're going to be posting things that are upsetting, give people an action they can take so that it kind of is a resolution for them. And it also is a resolution for the cat. It gives a little bit of action to, you know, the stories that you're telling. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Accidental Exiles by Bruce Perry. Jesse McAllister, a young Texan and a rock war vet, escapes to Europe where he seeks a new direction and to heal his desert wounds. Wandering the streets of Ascona, Switzerland, he meets and falls in love with a beautiful Italian waitress named Sonia Altarelli. Since the horrors of combat he encountered with a boyhood friend, Jesse will have nothing more to do with war. This story is his farewell to arms. Check out Accidental Exiles on Amazon.com today. 
Are you starting to think about that special holiday gift? Why not give the gift of a Community Cats podcast branded t-shirt, coffee mug, bag, or other item? This is the perfect way to spread the word about helping Community Cats. The proceeds from the sales will go to support the Community Cats podcast and the Community Cats Grants program, which helps small groups grow their fundraising programs to be able to fund more spay-neuter programs for free-roaming cats. Go to www communitycatspodcast.com and click on our shop button in the menu bar today to get that perfect community cat gift right now. Thank you everybody for supporting the show. I'm going to slip back into Facebook for a minute. You you have 200,000 friends on Facebook. Did that just come organically or was there some boosting with the advertising that goes into that? I I find that organizations are very leery about putting advertising dollars into Facebook, but yet I feel that there is a payout or a payoff from that to a certain degree. But I, I just didn't know if your growth was purely organic or if you had helped it with some advertising. Yeah. So just to clarify, my biggest audience is Instagram. I have over 200,000 people there. On Facebook, I only created my Facebook earlier this year because what we're talking about that I realized, wait a minute, I need to be on multiple platforms. So I created the Facebook maybe in February of this year. And it is a little bit slower growing for me than Instagram is. Um, And I think that that's probably just, you know, the nature of who I am and what I look like, what I do. Um, A lot of people tag each other in my stuff on Instagram and I get a lot of organic growth there. So I've never paid for advertising or anything like that on Instagram. I get about a thousand new followers a day and it's all, it's all completely organic. On Facebook, when I got it, I did one time that I tried to boost a post to see how it worked. I paid like $5 to boost this picture of like a kitten in a bowl um, (laughs) to see what it would do. I didn't find that it did very much for me, um, but I know that it has worked for other groups. So it's something to consider. I would say the better thing for me, because I don't currently do anything like that, the thing that I have found to be better than that is if you are creating really shareable content. If you create things that people want to share, then it gets people to your page. If you create a very funny video or if you create a beautiful photo that people just have to see. And I will say also, if you specifically say in it, like, please share this, sometimes you have to ask directly. So if you put in it, like, do you love this? Please share. Um, and people will share it. And even if, you know, it only gets 12 shares the first time, those are people who are going to see it, who are going to click on your page and like it. And then that's kind of how you get that growth. So my growth there is definitely slower. I haven't had it as long and I'm still learning as I go. You know, I'm definitely not a social media expert, but I think I have pretty good instincts with it and I know what I like to see. So, you know, think about the content that you like to see or that you see being shared amongst your friends and then think, you know, how can you create something similar? Now I'm going to touch upon a bit about the media. How are you getting your name out in the media? I don't know. (laughs) They find me. (laughs) I've never done, I've done one press release ever. And that was a really special circumstance that was just because I had a story that was so cute that I was like, someone needs to do a story on this. No, I get approached all the time. I actually get approached more than I can respond to. So unfortunately, sometimes I have to let something go or I have to respond and say, I'm sorry, I don't have time to do it. But sometimes there are stories like the Wall Street Journal. I wasn't interviewed for that. They, I just found out about it. Actually, Venus, the two-faced cat who was also in that article, she called me and said, did you know that we were both in the Wall Street Journal today? <laughs> I said, I had no idea. So, you know, sometimes I don't even know about it. Sometimes I'm contacted I do have a press page on my website. It's just kittenlady.org slash press where you can see, you know, some of the articles that I've been in. And it also has a way to contact me on there if you're a member of the media who wants to do a story with me. So, you know, I've been fortunate. I've been in a lot of local, national, and even international stories. And I think sometimes it one piggybacks on another. So someone will say, you know, I saw you in the Atlantic. And I work for the Washingtonian and I would love to put you in our magazine. So it happens organically. If you have a really interesting and compelling story, like that will happen. But you can do a press release. The press release that I did was about two orphans that I raised separately that were from different litters, but they were both little solo babies. 
and I was going to be introducing them for the first time. And so it was a really, really cute story of like these two little kittens that had never seen another kitten before uh, becoming friends. And those kittens now are adopted out. Their names are Bruno and Boop. You can actually follow them on Instagram. They have like 20,000 followers of their own because everybody loved this story. So if you look up Bruno and Boop on Instagram, you can find them. But, you know, that was a press release site I did. And you kind of make contacts as you do this stuff. And you could contact someone and say, hey, you know, you did a story on this thing. Would you like to do a story on this other thing? A lot of it does happen organically. You just have to have great stories and great photos, shareable content. You know, this stuff with community cats that we're doing is so fascinating. And I think sometimes... People are doing great work, but they don't know how to to take that great work and tell a story with it. So I would encourage people just to find one really compelling story you have, get some really beautiful photos and start there, like start with social media because that's a platform that you own. And then from there, see if you can get any local stories about it. It's not impossible to do and it can make a huge difference for your visibility. One thing you stress too, or there's two points that I've pulled out of what you were sharing is one is you basically have positioned yourself as being the expert. And so therefore you're easily Googled and all that kind of stuff. So if you are in a community running a small rescue or running an organization, you can just introduce yourself to your local press, not presenting even a story, but just getting to know them and doing introductions so that then when you do have a story... Or when they have a story that they have questions about, then they know to contact you to get the expert quote or the local quote to make sure that that you're the one getting into the paper. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're a local group, if you're a local rescue group or a local shelter, certainly you want to be seen as the go-to in your community if there is an article about cats, let's say there's an article that is very disparaging about cats. I mean, I think we all know that there's been some publicity about a book that is, I don't know if it just came out already or if it's coming out that is disparaging about community cats. If that book comes out, you want to be the person in your community that's on the news talking about that or that's writing the op-ed so that you are seen, you know, so that you have that visibility. Any rescuer or animal shelter director can reach out to their local media and say, you know, this is like, I'm a pillar of my community. This is, these are the services that I provide. And I have something to say about these issues so that you can start getting quoted and things like that. I mean, absolutely. That's something that I would recommend. And just the last point that I thought was interesting was the the press page on your website. And I'm certainly going to take a look at that press page. And I would ask everybody else to, because I think that is a forgotten component of most websites. Yeah, I think it's cool. I mean, and if I don't have, because some of it is online articles, but some of it is like magazines that I've been in, in like Turkey or Germany, where I don't have like an online version of it, but I'll actually get a PDF and you can host that PDF on your website so people can actually read it like they're reading a magazine from another country. And all of that, it helps a lot if people can see your story being told in lots of different ways. I think, you know, having that on your website definitely also attracts other people to be interested in doing a story on you because they can see similar stories that have been done in the past. Hannah, if people are interested in finding you, which I guess is probably not that hard, how would they do that? Yeah, so I have a website. It's kittenlady.org. So that is my hub for all of my, you know, information on there. But social media is the best way to keep up with me. So on Instagram, which is my biggest audience, you have to follow. It's Kitten X Lady. And then on my Facebook, it's the same thing. It's just facebook.com slash kitten X lady. And then I also have a YouTube channel. My YouTube, I really encourage people to subscribe to because I post some pretty cool stuff on there. Everything from, you know, instructional videos, like how do you bottle feed? How do you deal with dehydration in a kitten? Everything from that to like really fun stuff. Like if you're raising an orphan, but you want to go bowling, how do you do that? Can you take them with you? (laughs) Um, And then I also post things like last week, I was in New York teaching a workshop and I rescued a kitten on the street and I showed how did I safely rescue a kitten without a trap while I was in Brooklyn at midnight, you know? And so I'll show the videos of the day-to-day life of a professional cat lady. Like, what does that look like? And some of it's instructional, some of it's just fun. Um, But you can find that at youtube.com slash kitten lady. And Hannah, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? 
I just really want people to feel empowered to get involved with community cats and kittens where they live. I hear all the time people say, I wish I lived in DC so I could help you. And I say, you don't have to live in DC to help cats and kittens. This is something that we need people everywhere to be getting involved in. So I just want people to feel empowered that they can do this too. It's not like I'm some special person who knows everything. I'm a person who cares and is dedicated, but any person can be dedicated and get involved, start to learn, you know, reach out to your local community. If you're a first time rescuer and, or you're a person who's never found a cat outside or you found cats outside, but you didn't know what to do, look up, like just go on Google. Sometimes people ask me, how do I find them? I'm like, go to Google, Mm -hmm. (laughs) go to Google, type in where you live and rescue or TNR or shelter, and then go start volunteering because it takes all of us to make the world a better place for cats and kittens. And every single person can play a part, whether you're trapping or rescuing, fostering, or even just transporting cats or taking photos of them. You know, there's so many ways to help. So that's the one big thing that I try to say. It's just personal empowerment to get involved in whatever way you can. Hannah, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on my show, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to a Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 